Right. No, um, the question is, is, would Christ have sinned if he had just said, uh, thy will be done? Um, the, the issue is not necessarily the, the words used as much as the expression of the Savior's heart. So what I was trying to get at really there um, is that in Christ's prayer, let this cup pass from me. Um, on the one side, as a perfect man, he desires communion with God above everything else. And so there's a recoiling from the idea that he's going to be separated from the fellowship of his Father, and he must desire that supremely. But then on the other side, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, shows the submission to the cross nonetheless. So it's something that's difficult in our minds in the sense that he simultaneously desires fellowship with his Father above everything. That's the let the cup pass. But he also desires in that fellowship submission to the Father's will. Hence, thy will be done. So it's, the, it's really the idea on both sides that's important. Um, there's, there's more than one thing going on at the same time. And in an analogous way, it's kind of that way with us too. I mean, think about uh, a Christian funeral. Um, someone, well, at, at the seminary, Dr. McGoldrick just lost his wife. And uh, he actually preached at, at the memorial service. I'm not sure if I could uh, manage that. And it was moving, you know, the way he presented the gospel. And he was in tears uh, because he was sad about the loss of his dear wife. But he was also full of joy that she sees the face of Christ. And can a man have uh, two sentiments at the same time and both be righteous? Yes. You know, he rejoices in his wife. Uh, being with Christ, even as he grieves over her loss. And I think, I think that's the way I understand the garden at this stage, is uh, Christ recoils from the breach of fellowship, but he submits to the Father's will, and both things have to be true. Does that help a little bit? It's a good question. Anything else? Any other questions? I threaten my Sunday school class, if you don't ask me questions, I'm going to ask you questions. So that's an idle threat, by the way. But go ahead, Jeremy. Okay, so um, the, the question is that um, in current debates, there's a discussion of what's often called the eternal subordination of the Son. So in other words, the, because the Father is a Father and the Son is a Son and sons should be subject to their fathers, then uh, the Son himself, the Son of God, is eternally subject to his eternal Father. Um, and the... The rationale behind this is actually trying to deal with the role relationships between men and women. So what they're trying to say is, for example, a, a wife can be in, in subjection to her husband or submit to her husband while still being on equal footing, so they're of equal dignity. Um, and, and that's certainly true. We're all made in the image of God. We're of equal dignity on, on equal footing. Um, let me start with that and then push back to the covenant issue. I think that the problem here is that there's a, a confusion in this issue on the eternal subordination of the Son between order and submission. 
An order and submission are not necessarily the same thing. Um, even relationships that involve submission are, are not the same. So uh, wives submit to your husbands is different in many ways than children obey your parents or slaves obey your master. Those relationships differ. And ultimately, the relationship between the father and the son is not just different but unique. Because um, when the father and the son are described as equals in Scripture, um, the church has always confessed that there is order but not subordination. So the father um, begets the son from all eternity. The son is begotten of the father. And then the spirit proceeds from the father and the son. And that's not referring to, to causes or uh, principles or creation or time or anything like that. But it's, in a way, just trying to wrestle with the Bible and what it says about the persons and how they relate and describe um, how each person is God. They're all God equal with the Father, but the Father is ungenerate, the Son as eternally generate, and the Spirit as eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. And there's complete equality because, again, um, it's not as though you have... The divine essence is one thing over here, and then you draw out three lines, and now you've got three persons, or they carve it up and take three parts of the pie. The one God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And those personal distinctions, the only thing that's different between them or distinct among them are these relationships, unregenerate uh, or ungenerate, um, begotten and eternally proceeding. Any kind of subordination would point to authority, superiority, uh, something like that. And so I think that the problem is that people are wrestling with the New Testament and looking at texts that deal with the incarnate Christ, and they're confusing statements that refer to God and human flesh rather than just abstractly talking about the Trinity. So when Jesus says, my father is greater than I, I mean, everyone would agree that that doesn't mean father's a better God than I am. But it also doesn't mean that, that in my deity, I'm subordinate to the father. What it means is that, that I'm not only God, but man. And my father is greater than I. Um, and, and there are many such statements throughout the New Testament. So we not only take the Trinity seriously, we take the two natures of Christ seriously. And we need to be very careful with these types of things. Maybe something else uh, that we should think about here. This starts as a discussion of role relations between men and women, and then it ends up in an analogy to God. But we have to remember, when we use analogies like that, which we really have to every time we talk about God, it's not that God is analogous to us, but we're analogous to him. There's a big difference between that. We don't just look at ourselves like the Greeks did and say, if I were bigger and stronger, I'd look like Zeus. That's not the issue. But um, we understand ourselves in light of him, not him in light of us. The analogy goes that way. And I think there's some of that problem here. What about the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son? Well, again, the, the issue is not that the Son is eternally subordinated to the Father, and therefore he takes on human flesh. The real issue um, is that the, the Son voluntarily condescends to take on human flesh. There's no compulsion. He doesn't have to do it. But also, there's one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. There's one will in God exercised from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. And there's a complete harmony, a complete unity of action, a complete interpenetration and indwelling of the persons. And so the Father accomplishes the work of redemption in, in one way, so to speak, or emphasizes one facet of it, while the Son another and the Spirit another. And this is how God does everything. So how does God create the world? Through His Son and by His Spirit, right? All things came into being through the, through the Word, through Christ. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. But what's the Spirit doing? Hovering over the face of the deep, completing the work. 
Christ was born of the Virgin Mary or conceived in the, the womb of Mary. Um, the Son becomes incarnate, not the Father. The Father sends the Son. The Father originates the work. The Son effects it or, or, or brings it to pass. But how is he in, in, incarnate? Well, the Holy Spirit overshadows her. He's conceived by the power of the Spirit in the womb of the Mary, Virgin Mary, and he perfects the work. And so it is with the eternal plan. You have the Father representing the majesty of the Godhead as he almost always does throughout the Bible, not to the exclusion of the Son and the Spirit, but then you have the Son effecting the work and the plan and the Spirit perfecting it and bringing it to completion. And everything God does, he does that way. By the way, here's just, this isn't exactly part of your question, but this whole idea of the Father representing the, the origin of the divine works, the majesty of the Godhead, um, the term theos, God, in the New Testament, most of the time refers to the Father. And that's significant. And it doesn't mean the Son's not God or the Spirit's not God. It's applied to the Spirit one time in Acts 5. There's lots of divine works ascribed to him. There's lots of other reasons pointing to his deity. But the Father represents the majesty of the whole Trinity. And the Son accomplishes the purposes of the whole Trinity. The Spirit perfects and brings all of them to completion. This is why the Son purchases redemption. The Spirit applies redemption. And the Father elects us. It just reflects who He is. And so the eternal covenant is exactly the same way. Go ahead. So the question would be, uh, with all the Christological problems, heresies in the first 500 years, um, you know, we have problems today too. Which ones are most prevalent? That's a very difficult question to answer. You know, it's it's um, there's a lot of issues there. I think um, maybe to to answer that before I identify specifics, it might be helpful just to point out a general tendency we have. Um, I think it's interesting, Carl Truman said this once, um, in the 4th and 5th century, the best-selling Christian books for the average Christian um, were on the Trinity and the person of Christ. And, and people in the pew basically viewed it as, this is the most important thing I could ever think about. This is the most practical thing in the Christian life. And what I find that is really interesting is if you read, say, uh, the Greek father, Gregory Nazianzen, um, and his, his preaching, what astonishes me is, is the depths of specificity they use in preaching the doctrine of the Trinity, preaching the two natures of Christ. Things that, that to be honest, in a conference like this, I'm trying to hold back and, and not throw out all the theological terms and distinctions. But what's really remarkable about it is it's not a theological lecture. I mean, you read this and you feel like heaven and earth is on the line. And he's not preaching this theor theoretically for you to think about and go puzzle over. But he wants you to love the Father, love the Son, love the Spirit. There's a passion in the preaching. I think that's, that's significant. So Truman says those are the best-selling books back then. What are the best-selling books today? Anyone want to guess at least Truman's answer? What are the best Christian bestsellers today? I knew someone would say Joel Osteen, yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of true, isn't it? Um, at least the statistics he found, it was on Christian dieting. You know, people want the Daniel diet, the Ezekiel diet, you know, wh whatever else it is. Um, I'm, I'm all in favor of, of eating well, if you know me at all, but um, that's not the point, is it? I mean, it's, it's what Jesus would say is straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So that says something itself. We just think, you know, all, this, all these fine distinctions, all this stuff about the two natures, all this stuff about the Trinity, who cares? That's for the theologians. Not a big deal. But 
tell me how to eat better by following Daniel's diet. I mean, that says a lot about us. If that's the attitude we have to Christology, then we're going to run into all kinds of heresy. Just the attitude. So we're going to expect that there are going to be those who undermine his deity on the one side, those who undermine his humanity on the other side. Um, sometimes we overcorrect. So people can be so zealous to say, you know, the liberal theologians were denying that Jesus was divine and we really need to prove that, that we end up never talking about his humanity and the reality of it, the progression of his obedience, for example. That's a lost concept. Um, and, and things like that lead us into trouble, either, either by overcorrecting um, or in, in some of these, these other ways. So I think, to be honest, the, the real problem is that most people just um, don't think it's worth the time to think as deeply about these things anymore. And, and what I've been trying to do is try to show again, this is why it's worth the time. This is why we need to think about this. It's a good question. Other questions? Go ahead. You get two for one. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, you're talking about Narnia, the Tisrock. I'm trying to think what book of the Bible that's in. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I disagree with what um, Lewis is doing there, um, where the, the man is worshiping. Um, the name was there in my, my head a moment ago, but the false god that he's serving is really a demon. Uh, Tosh, thank you. Yeah, Tash, whatever. Um, yeah, so, yeah, no, I disagree with what he's doing. You know, I, I think whatever God, you know, sometimes we ask questions like, well, well, I believe God can save people without the gospel. Don't you think God can save people without preaching? Well, sure. I mean, I believe God could have created the world differently than he did, too. You know, I believe God could do lots of things. That's really not the question, is it? The question is, what has God told us? Well, he tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And how shall they believe him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach without, unless they're sent? And I think that's the type of thing that we should just say, that's good enough. Uh, we need to send missionaries. We need to evangelize. There are other questions. You have a false understanding of who Jesus is and still be saved. My students are used to this. Um, yes and no. So, um, you know, it depends. I think, let's, let's say for most of us, um, in, in my case, when I was converted, I came out of a non-Christian background, and uh, when I came to the Lord, I was in a Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew, and um, the teacher kept referring to this Paul character. And I thought, maybe this is one of his favorite theologians. And I started reading the New Testament and find out Paul wrote a lot of this. The um, point is that a lot of people are like that. You know, you know nothing about the Bible. And I, at that time, had a simple faith that uh, I, knew, I knew Jesus was God, knew he was man. I might not know exactly what that means. Um, but I know that he died for my sins, and I'm willing to believe whatever he tells me and do whatever he commands me. And that's how simple it gets. Can someone be saved with a simple profession like that? Absolutely. Um, but then we grow into our understanding. Theologically, I was an antinomian. I would have said, you know, it doesn't matter how you live because Christ died for you and you're saved. But then I read the Sermon on the Mount and say, Lord, make me like this. And, and you know that by experience, too. There's just something in the heart of the Christian. That's what happens. And the Spirit's working, and he knows better than you do. So people can be confused. Um, I think that true Christians will grow in their faith, and true Christians won't be satisfied with a bare minimum either. You know, I mean, I've been, I just finished, uh, almost finished reading Ephesians today, and the term knowledge stood out to me. It jumps out all over the book. 
Paul wants us to increase in the knowledge of Christ. He wants us to increase in the knowledge of God. He wants us to know what the will of God is. He wants us to know the depths and the riches and the height, the breadth of the love of Christ. And, and I think it's true that as believers about the doctrine of Christ or anything else, um, we grow at different rates. We have bad times and good times, but there is an aspect in the soul where we just can't get enough. We want more. And it's not always that way, but that's where the Lord will take us. Um, and so I think we'll grow. So can there be misunderstandings and lack of clarity? Yes. Where do you draw the line? I, I don't know. Um, you know, John Owen's book on justification, very interestingly, one of the first things he says is Roman Catholicism is a complete denial of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you really believe what they're teaching, you can't be saved. But then, does he say, then he says an interesting question. Can somebody be saved who's a Roman Catholic and believes a Roman Catholic gospel and anathematizes a Protestant? He still says possibly. And he's not denying the importance of the doctrine, but he says they, they may know better in their hearts than they're saying with their mouths. They're really trusting in Jesus Christ. I mentioned Thomas Aquinas before. If you really follow out his sacramental theology, it's bad. And, uh, and yet at the same time, it really just comes down to, he, he firmly teaches, you're saved through Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ. And uh, his, I think his heart is better than his theology at points. He's a good theologian in many ways, but, but there's ways in which that happens. And so please take that with caution because I'm not saying, you know, Rome is good or... You know, these heretical teachings are good, or it's okay to be blurry on these things. But I am saying that um, the grace of God can be at work in, in people with confusion. And uh, we don't know where to draw the line. We want to bring them to a better knowledge, too, is, is important. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. So the question would be, what about the status of infants dying in infancy? Um, the statement in the Westminster Confession about elect infants dying in infancy, um, the men who wrote it almost sound like politicians there uh, because they're noncommittal, aren't they? Um, which infants go to heaven? Well, elect ones. Are there any? Are there not any? I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's really broad, and I think that's appropriate for a confession. Because there have been different views on that. Some have taught that all infants dying in infancy will be saved. So you read Charles Hodge's systematic theology. He, he approaches that uh, for his own reasons. Um, then you read some of the Southern Presbyterians like Thornwell. And they almost go the opposite direction. That they presume everyone's unregenerate, including the infants of believers. And, um, you know, and then you've got people in the middle. We don't presume they're regenerate or unregenerate. But we're hopeful in the promises. I'm, I probably land more in that direction. Um, you know, and um, I would say this, um, the canons of Dort say that the infants of believers, when they die in infancy, believers have no reason to doubt their election before God. I think that's good ground. I think that the supplement in the Westminster Confession basically says, um, that's about as far as we know for sure. So I'm not willing to say they all do or they all don't, or anything in between. I'm willing to say that because of the covenant promises that I'll circumcise your heart, the heart of your children, my law which I put in your heart, I'll put in the heart of your children, um, I'll be your God, I'll be the God of your children, um, you know, my, my spirit will not depart from you or from your children, your children's children. I think that uh, that's not a promise God absolutely always saves the children of believers at all times, but I think it does show us that this is God's normal way of acting. And if God in his providence takes our infants out of this world in infancy, um, I think that we have every warrant, as Dort says, not to doubt their election before God, because Christ saves them. They're still sinners. They still need salvation. But I, th I think 
that's why. So it's good, it's good not to push everything in a confession at least. Go ahead. Before Abraham was, I am. Well, the first thing is it means Jesus existed before Abraham. But, of course, Jesus is a man and he's living later in, in that time and not when Abraham was on the earth, well after Abraham died. So what he means is uh, with the I am, he's, he's quoting Exodus 3 where God says, I am that I am. So what he's saying is before Abraham was... I am God. I've always been God. I've always been there. So that's why Jesus is there before Abraham. It's a good question. Thank you. Anything else before we close with prayer? Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you again for the time that you've given us to discuss these great truths. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to think your thoughts after you, to be stu students of the Bible, and to be filled with the Spirit, that we would read well, that we would understand well, that we would not be satisfied with our current level of holiness or our cur current knowledge of Christ, that we would rejoice in what you've given us and strive for more by the help of your Spirit. And we thank you, O Lord, that you will complete your work in us and you will bring us face to face before Jesus and to see him in his glory. And we pray, Lord, as we think about these things, you would help us to run well now. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all.